for coming to the jazz room today and Park. And I'm actually a volunteer of cultural exchange at the jazz room for about today. Uh, thanks to the volunteer exchange program, I got a great chance to be the host and so as open space room. But before beginning, I would like to ask your cooperation to turn on your cell phones for a seat to sound room during the talk. 소지하고 핸드폰을 먼저 무음으로 바꿔주시면 감사하겠습니다. In almost every country you go to, you may easily find find freedom. Um, whether they just prefer visiting, studying, or immigrating to live your life. But today is talk about uh, the those the life of those Korean living abroad and some of the issues they have to deal with. So, um, lots of Korean immigrants are so ambiguous group to categorize. So they are often labeled um, as Korean when they are returned to Korea. So uh, there are lots of there are so many uh, you know, sorry so many uh, Korean. Uh, Oh, sorry, there are currently only you know, seven million Koreans living abroad. They are often labeled as foreign when they return to Korea. Those Korean diasporas are called Gyokpo um, in Korean. The idea of what the Gyokpo word means uh, very, uh, very birds. Um, I'm sorry, very birds in Korean society. I'm going to tell you about my uh, Gyokpo friends. She, both her parents are Korean, but she grew up in Philippines and um, Philippines. And she, uh, but she, oh sorry, so her native uh, language is English, which she speaks better than Korea. She wanted to come to Korea and get a job because she always considered herself as a real Korean. So when I first met her. She has just been here for a month, and she has already had some problem being uh, heard and foreign Korean. So one day she asked an uh, older man on the street for directions. Um, but the older man uh, criticized her for her inadequate Korean. So she felt so sad and became uh, hesitant talking with Korean on the street. So today Tor um, touches similar issues and I hope everyone will think about this problem and discuss the topic in today's tour. So the presenter is Jo Zuyeon, a coordinator of teaching and uh, teaching and learning Korean program at the Jeonna. He is going to talk about her experience and so ladies and gentlemen, please give her a thunderous applause. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the introduce, uh, introduction. Uh, Hi, everyone. My name is Jian Cho, and I am the coordinator for TOP program, and I work for the Cheonnam Kuncheong, Cheonnam Office of Education. and. Um, we are a program that uh, allows schools in rural areas have a opportunity to have a foreign teacher because you don't get exposure to English as much as some of the other more city schools. But uh, anyway, that's my program and I'd like to tell you a little bit about me today and my personal experiences as a Jopo in Korea. Uh, I'd like to start by Showing you uh -huh. this. Uh, Gyokpo, people say Gyokpo, Gyokpo a lot. A lot of people don't know what that means. A lot of Koreans don't know what that means. Uh, Gyokpo is pretty much anybody that is of Korean descent that lives abroad. So it could be Canada, it could be USA, it could be Australia. Um, and there are seven, about seven million of us out there in the world. There's 50 million Korean people in Korea, and in the world, there are seven, Korean, uh, seven million Korean 
immigrants. And basically, four fifths of the expatriate Koreans live in three countries, and that's uh, China, the US, and Japan. That's where most of the people are. I am from the US. <clears throat> so, what is a gyopo? Uh, the term gyopo or dongpo abroad. They refer to people of Korean of ethnic descent who have lived the majority of their lives outside of Korea. That is a lot of the Korean teachers that come through my program, that come through a lot of language program. <clears throat> if you see Koreans that speak English, that they, they lived abroad, they are here for us. I'm here for <laughs> And it's one of those things where I was kind of unsure about how I felt about it before when I was living in the States. Uh, it's oftentimes that I get labeled, you know, oh, that Korean person or that Asian girl, never as an American, which was okay, but I always thought that if I had an opportunity to go to Korea, I could just kind of blend and I could be a part of my people. I don't have to explain what it is that I am because I'm just here and with all of you, but not exactly how it goes. A small intro about what a uh, story of a Kyoko is. I'll, I'll show you mine because obviously I know my story very well and mine is the only one I know well enough to tell. So, this is me. Ah, that's also me. This is my mom. And this is the 1980s. I immigrated to Virginia near Washington, D.C. Uh, in 1990. I was eight years old. And I am from Kyungido. I am from uh, Seoul. And we moved to the U.S. in 1990, where it was the year where they had the biggest number of Korean Amer like Koreans from Korea migrate over to the US. Koreans have been migrating over to, immigrating over to the US or Canada for many, many years, but it was in 1990 that the biggest number went, and that was my group. So I think it was like 358,200 and something, and I'm like, the three is me, my brother, and my mom. So uh, that was a long time ago. From this is all taken in Korea. I was born in Korea. We went to Jinjido with my family. This is an Anton with my grandma. This is my dad. Um, he moved to the U.S. before us. He went there three years before taking my mom and my brother. And he worked very hard from the back of a truck. My dad worked. Uh, selling books door to door back in the 19, 1987 until 1990, door to door selling cooking books to Korean families uh, all over the United States. And we had very little money, but he worked very hard and saved up enough to buy a plane ticket for me, my brother, and my mom, and enough for a small condo to have us live there and go to school. And I had a very fulfilling American life. My life is, as you can see, very diverse of people, friends from many different countries. And I did many, you know, American things. I did triathlons and, you know, I had big giant group dinners for friends' graduations. And I worked for a law firm in uh, Boston. Austin. This is where I went to school and lived for the last seven years of my life. Uh, I went to a university in America. I had uh, a full American education from elementary, middle to college. And my family, on my dad's side, all of my family, they live in the U.S. These are my cousins. And now they graduated, you know, from universities 
in America too. So basically, my story today is, who are we and why are we here? Um, we are usually people that were born here from Korean parents who moved to a different country and lived most of our lives, either in Canada, US, or Australia, or wherever. Or we are people where our parents went to these foreign countries and had us there. And so we were born either in the US, or Canada, or Australia. But regardless, we're all Korean. And if you can see, these are my kids. I am the coordinator for TALK program, and these are our teachers. And this is just a very small group of the Kyokos that came. Uh, this is just maybe 1% out of so many all over Korea that came. And I asked a lot of them why they came here. So why did you come to Korea? You know, you're living fine in America. You're having a great life in Canada. Why are you here? And almost 99% of them told me it's because they wanted to see where they came from. They know very little about their Korean heritage. They wanted to connect with their roots. They wanted to see family. And a lot of them, including me, wanted to know what our lives would have been like had we never left. If we had grown up in Korea like we were supposed to before we immigrated, who would we be here? And we just wanted to see if it was kind of like, if I can call this place a home, like where do I belong? Who am I? And so a lot of these kids took the opportunity to join language programs for six months to a year, to have an opportunity to live here, earn money, and find out in that time who they are and where they come from. A lot of them came for a sense of being a lot of them come for jobs, yes, and travel, but 99% of them come here because they want to find their roots and see family. Um, when we live abroad, uh, we are always either, we're something, we're Korean, we're Asian, we're Chinese, we're Japanese, we're something. We're never, or maybe that's more America. America does that a lot. You're Korean American, you're Chinese American. I don't think Canadians do it quite as much. But um, when I personally was in the States, I felt like I had to, there's a lot of boxes to check. Like, I'm from East Asia, I'm from Korea. Like, you have to put labels on yourself a lot. And I just wanted to be at a place just for a day where I can walk down the street and just be like everyone else. Um, I think no matter what country you live in, and whether you be, you know, Korean or you be American or you be Canadian, you want roots somewhere. You want to know that you belong somewhere, or that you can call some place your home. And I think a lot of the immigrants that move abroad, they call America home, they call Canada home, they call Australia home, and that's okay. And a lot of them are comfortable with it. I personally am not because I wanted to, I, I always felt like I was a floater. I always have to bounce back between two cultures. I come from a very traditional Korean home where, you know, the outside world expects me to be very American in school, at my job, you know, with my foreign friends. But when I come home, the minute I close the door, my parents wanted and needed me to be Korean, speak Korean, eat Korean food. You know, I respect my elders and do all that sort of stuff. Not that everybody else does it, but I'm saying in my home, we did. And uh, sometimes you feel like you're juggling a lot. And you don't have like a sense of like, this is who I am. You're always balancing. So, are we foreigners or are we not? Because I think most of Korea, when they see Korean immigrants, or kill pose, they think, yes, they're foreign, um, or wigook. They call all of Korean immigrants wigook, right? Uh, they're from abroad, they're not like us, they're different from us. And so, uh, they, we 
cook Korean. You know, we speak Korean. I speak fluent Korean. And I love Korean food. And my parents are Korean. My grandparents are Korean. Everybody in my family is Korean. But I think culturally, we're very foreign. It's one of those things I think that cannot be helped. You've been exposed to a certain lifestyle and a way of thinking 24 hours a day, every day, for many, many, many years in your life. You get accustomed to a certain way of living. And you can't always think, yes, I'm Korean, I'm so away from you get, you get influenced by that. Whether you try to or not, it becomes you. And I guess I thought I was very Korean. I was like, I'm going to go to Korea, I'm going to be Korean, I'm going to finally meet my home. And then I realized, I'm so different. I am so different. And I get told this all the time. You're too loud. You're too outspoken. You know? You're too opinionated. You're, you're too free. But this is me. All of these people, just a tiny sample of Korean immigrants abroad. They're either first generation or second generation or third. A lot of you guys know John Park, right? And you got that guy from Lost. You got that that 2 p.m. that 2 p.m. guy. And then you got Mickey Mouse. You got Lena Park, uh, Harold and Kumar. Yeah. yeah. And so you take a Korean person and then you try to tell them, hey, we're not foreign. We're like you. But then the Korean person sees all of this and goes, you're foreign. You know, you speak English. You like hamburgers. You. You're very loud and you do whatever you want to do. He, you can't, they get very confused. They don't know where to put us. A lot of the time, when you see foreigners, you can just say, foreigner. And it makes it easier to understand. It makes you understand, like, how you're going to approach this person, what to expect from this person, or not to expect, because they're foreign. But when you see a Korean immigrant or Kyoko, you don't know what you should be expecting or how to approach them because they're all very different. You know, we come from very different walks of life, from many different countries. We're not one cookie cutter Korean immigrant. And so they think, let's just call them for it. That makes it a lot easier to process. But like I said, we're not one category. We are very complex. And we come from very different backgrounds. Once again, these are another just five random people in my program in Tona. They're here. And they probably walk around your town. You know, you've probably seen them at the supermarket or something. You just never know that they're Kyoko because they look Korean. But this is Wajun. He immigrated to the U.S. when he was five years old. And he's a first generation Korean American. This is Minju, or Jasmine. And she immigrated to Canada at 10 years old. And she's a first generation Korean Canadian. This is Catherine Song. She's born in California. And she's a second generation Korean American. As in Nari, Nari Kim, who was born in New York, lived her whole life in New York, and she's a second generation Korean American. And this is Jin. Uh, Jin immigrated to New Zealand from Korea when he was three. And he lived in New Zealand from three to eight. And then at eight, he immigrated to the US, and now he's a first generation Korean American immigrant. So, Everybody's background is so diverse. Uh, their way of thinking, every single one of them will vary. Because you can be Korean American, but even in that sense, depending on if you immigrated five years ago, if you immigrated 10 years ago, you immigrated 30 years ago, your thinking is very different. Your, uh, how much of you is more prone to be American than you know, in terms of relating to Korea? It varies, and so there is no one way to kind of understand Korean Americans 
in general, let alone Korean Canadians, Korean Australians, their policies are very different too because each one of these countries is very different on you know, how they on how they work. I guess my main part of the presentation today is our perspective as Korean immigrants on how we see Korea looking at Korean immigrants and then the Korean perspective on how you see us. Uh, first, the Korean perspective on Korean immigrants. When a Korean person looks at people like me, when they look at people like me, uh, there's many stereotypes. And I've asked tons of people, Korean people, native Koreans, and then I've asked a ton of Korean immigrants. And it's amazing how they all say the same thing. Um, I, asked the, I asked the people of my office, I said, what do you think when you think what do you think when you think Koreans from abroad? They, they, they're oftentimes very egotistic and very self-involved. They don't think about what's good for everyone, as in the community and the team, family, friends. They only think about what's good for them. They're very American. And they don't know the culture of respecting their elders. Korea has a very distinct system of respecting your elders and you know like there's a place for people who are older and then people who are younger. There's mannerisms that you match according to that. Um, there's not quite such a culture in America where I am from but I mean we do know about respecting our elders as well. And they're too free. They're too liberal. You know they were Shirts are just reveal everything. They talk too much. They say whatever they want to say. They want everything that's convenient to them. Everything is just very liberal and free. Um, obviously, we're not conservative <coughs> enough. They're foreigners, but there's an unspoken expectancy that they should know Korean culture and language. That's, I think, what causes the most amount of problems between Korean immigrants and native it's when we look Korean and talk, you know, Korean, whether it be well or not so well. But because we are, even if you are foreigner to me, you should know what I say, what I'm saying in Korean, because we speak Korean. You should understand how to do these things already, because Korean people do. But when situations call for it to be more convenient that we're foreign, we're foreigners. You're foreign. But when certain situations would be more beneficial that Korean immigrants should be more Korean, you lean more towards that. And then when we can't do it, people get offended. How come you don't know that? Your parents didn't teach you that? You know, like, oh, maybe in America you don't know about stuff like that? Um, but it's just, like I said, we're, we're very different varying levels of uh, how much we follow Korean culture. It's just where we come from or how long we've been there. Um, just because you run into one Kyoko that does not speak a word of Korean, that you know is very American, doesn't mean all Kyoko are like that. And just because you find one Kyoko that speaks fluent Korean, and like follows everything, Korean mannerisms, etiquette, you know, elders and you know, youngers, and you can't expect all Kyokos to be like that either. We're very different, all of us. Um, they are only who they are today because they were blessed with parents that had the money to give them a life abroad. They think that uh, there's, I've experienced, I can only speak on my behalf, but I've experienced a negative connotation when you say Kyoko. It's not always a positive meaning. It's because you think, oh, they had the money to go. They had the ability to make a better life, and I didn't. You know, like, it's not always true. My dad had a few hundred dollars that's all he had to go to the state that he made a life out of that for three years. All of my uncles did. Uh, you know, we 
had times where we were really hitting rock bottom. We didn't have extravagant amounts of money to move to America and give me a very extravagantly American life. We didn't. If anything, I think my life was more Korean there than I think it was here when I, uh, I was here until eight. But my parents raised me very strict and very Korean because they said I should never forget who I am, where I come from, what my family and me being Korean means, and my brother's the same way. We speak Korean fluently. We understand everything culturally in that goes on in Korea. But like I said, not everybody's like that. Um, another problem is when we speak English as Koreans, and I had a, an incident where I have other Kyoko friends, and when we go outside, we feel more comfortable communicating in English. So there's two Korean people speaking English in Korea. I don't know why, but that gets a lot of people mad. So um, we went to a coffee shop, and we were having coffee. But we're obviously very Korean, the two of us, and we're giggling away really loud in English. And people left, and they said, basically, that we're showing off. That they think they're better than us. But we just communicate better in English. We were just talking. And I thought, maybe that's just here. But the same thing happened in Seoul. I thought maybe they'd be a little bit more open-minded because they have so many forms up there. But they're not. We had the same thing happen in Seoul. With the same friend. So I'm thinking maybe I should just stop hanging out with my friend. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, I run a program that deals with uh, giving rural schools foreign teachers um, and a, a chance to learn English and our program is like a scholarship program where we kind of go like volunteers sort of and volunteer our time teaching English to schools that cannot oftentimes afford full-time English teachers. But when lots of Kyoko's come here and like I showed you pictures of like Jin and them earlier, a lot of their schools get really upset and they call the Office of Education and say, we don't want them. We don't want English speaking Korean teachers. Get them out of here. Give us a blonde person. Give us a black teacher. We want something that looks foreign so the kids can see foreign. You know, and it's amazing to me how a lot of the Korean immigrants that come here to teach, they try very hard because I don't know, maybe there's a sense of responsibility. You want to do well. You're in your, kind of like your own country, you know, your, of your people. And you want to give them the best that you can. And that's why you're here, to connect, right? To find where did you come from. So you want to give them the best that you've got. And when they say things like that, it hurts your feelings. I've had a principal go up to one of the Korean uh, teachers that are here and say, can you transfer? to a different school because you're not foreign. I'm sorry. And she said, I'm not. And he said, I don't care if you're born in America. I don't care if your parents are born in America. I want blonde. I want different color eyes. And that's really unfortunate. So I think while seeing so many of that, like those cases happen in Korea, it made me think, this is this is not right, you know. It's, I don't know, but the Korean immigrant, I think it's a mutual problem. Because Koreans might think that about Korean immigrants, but at the same time, Korean immigrants don't necessarily have the most positive outlook either. And I think they kind of feed the problems to each other. Because you get a bad experience coming here, and you're treated a certain way, and then you reflect that on Korea and say, oh, I don't really want to be here either. You know? I can go back to where I'm from and it's better there. I don't need to be here. That kind of negativity on both sides, I think, kind of escalates 
just this stereotype, it just reinforces it. And the Korean immigrant perspective of Native Koreans, they're too conservative and judgmental. When they see me, they don't want to know me. They don't want to know my name or where I came from. They just think, I'm foreign. Foreigner. And no matter what I do, they just go, you're too free. Maybe you're too conservative. You know, it's, it's a miscommunication, misunderstanding of cultures. Um, they don't understand foreigners and understand Kyoko's even less. They don't really care to know or want to change their way of thinking about them. When people make up their minds and think, this is how I see things, it's very hard to change them. Um, when I when I have teachers that go, Koreans are very judgmental. It's very hard to change their minds on that. And when Korean, native Koreans see foreigners and think they're too loud and liberal and very egotistic, it's hard to uproot that idea and implant a positive one. Um, it's much easier for somebody to invent a negative thought than it is for you to think of it positively. And I think both sides need a lot of work. So we're, this was an interesting thought. I asked one of my Kyoko teachers, what do you think about this? Korean immigrants in Korea, what do you think? And he said, we're in their country. And I guess I don't, I guess they don't have to get to know us or try to understand us. Like Koreans don't owe us anything. They don't have to get to know us. We are foreign and we're in their country. So why should they try hard to get to know me? In a sense, he's right. Uh, we are people that are from abroad. We had lives out there, but we're the ones that came to visit here. Uh, but at the same time, as much as logically this thought makes sense to me, it's kind of sad, I think, and very disheartening. Why should they have to get to know me? Cause because we're Korean. Because we're all Korean. You know, and if you see another fellow Korean, you know, you, you're nice and you go and talk to them and get to know them. You work together, you know. You see each other every day at school or wherever, but it's this kind of mindset, I think, like I said, it makes sense, but that doesn't really solve anything. It doesn't really put anything positively anywhere. It's just Being more foreign and Korean than native back home, every single Kyoko I've ever talked to in the year and a half that I've been here, they have told me I feel like a foreigner more here than I did anywhere else I was living. So Korean Americans come here and they think they are more foreign in Korea than they are back in the United States. Canadians, uh, I don't know, most of the people I talked to were American. But I think um, a few New Zealanders did, said the same thing, like there's nothing wrong with New Zealand. And there's nothing wrong with Korea. It's just I feel more like an outsider, foreigner, like I don't belong here than they do in New Zealand or in America. And I think that's also very, as a fellow Kyoko, that's very, it's very saddening. Before, for Koreans, when you meet the next Kyoko, right? you're working at a new job or you walk down the street or at a coffee shop and you meet a Kyoko. Before your brain registers foreigner, before you judge and think foreigner, take a moment to think that we're all very different people, but we're all in some way interconnected in Korea and that chances are whoever you meet Korea, that's a Korean immigrant, they are here because they want to find out where they come from. It's because they want to find out what their Korean heritage is. They're curious and they want to learn and that's why they're here. So before you block and say foreign, I don't want English, no thanks, before you do that, give them a chance. You know, give them another look. It's okay to smile at them and say hi in English. They would really welcome them. While I was making this, I came across the term Tonko. Tonko means like fellow people, fellow Koreans, right? Of the 
same descent, nationality, and it's an affectionate term. It's an affectionately saying, we are of the same people. They call people, Korean immigrants abroad, Hewe Gunpu. Hewe Gunpu means, you know, our fellow people abroad. Now, if this is a common term, which it is, I go down the street and they go, you're speaking English, but you're Korean. I say, oh, Kyoko. And he says, oh, Hewe Gunpu. And I said, yeah, okay. You know, but Hewe Gunpu, if Gunpu is an affectionate term to describe your fellow people, and you have a common term that you use called Hewe Gunpu, that should be a positive term. It should be reflecting positive feelings. And when you meet, you should think about the meaning of what this means. Instead of just saying kyoko, kyoko, whatever. Think about what that means. It means positive, affection, fellow people, connection. And so before you just immediately shut down and think, you know, oh, they're showing off with their English, or, you know, here they are you know, taking jobs and teaching English, and that's all they got, and they, their parents had money to take them abroad. And before all these negative thoughts come in,
open up and find out what's around you. Don't always close down and say, oh, they're all judgmental. I'm not even going to bother talking to them. That fixes nothing on both sides. Oh, that was supposed to be first. Not my big guy, sorry. Um, this is my, a picture of my first and second generation family back in 1990. I had two, two of them that were born in Korea that immigrated when they were babies. And then I had this one and that one that were born in Fairfax Nova Hospital in Virginia. So out of my baby cousins, I'm a first and second generation and they're all around the same age. This is them now. Uh, my cousin Lydia graduated with a PhD from Columbia last week. Um, this is our family formal dinner. Yeah, this is a very American thing to do. We go to a fancy restaurant, our entire family gets super dressed up like it's the prom, and then we have dinner together when we could be eating at home. Why? I don't know. But they do it, and it's just, you embrace the culture that you live in. You know what I mean? We have foreigners that want to live here forever, and a lot of, uh, there are few of them that I know that are lifers here, but they adjust. Korean immigrants need to do the same, I think, and open up their mind and adjust. And I think while we're all living together, I think Native Koreans, if they opened up their minds a little and adjusted to us, I think we can all get along very well. But currently there's a lot of problems where Korean kyokos like me come here and they see lots of negativity towards the image of what Korean American or Korean immigrant in Korea means. And so they go back, they don't stay. And that's a shame because I think Korea has come a very long way in a very short period of time to be a very internationally recognized country. And I think having the resources, which I like to think to impose in immigrants, we're resources. We're all over the world. There's seven million of us out there doing something with our lives speaking multi-languages, and we're all Korean. If we come here and we can make a difference, we can be some kind of a gateway to a different country. We can branch out internationally, grow economically, like we can be a resource. We can make help Korean world. You know, I'm not saying we're great. We're just like everyone else. But I'm saying in terms of skill sets, we might have something. And if more Korean people stay, that are from abroad, and then kind of work to make Korea a better place, I think that'd be really beneficial. But so far, there's so much stereotypes and negativity that hinders all of that. And there's always a wall between the two sides when we are really all just the same Koreans. I like for my, uh, my family and my brother to come here and live here someday, because I plan to live here. I came a year and a half ago, and I plan to live here for life. I love it here. Um, just a quick question. What has helped you remain fluently bilingual while you have been flooded with the English education system? Yeah, um, I think, well, I personally have a very dedicated love to learning everything Korean. I wanted to stay connected to this side because when you live in the US, you don't really have to try to stay connected to your US side, American side, because you're surrounded by it all the time. It's very easy if you don't pay attention to lose your Korean side. You lose the language slowly. And then uh, your parents, because they learn to speak English too, you become more culturally, I think, leaning towards the American without even trying. So you have to be constantly conscious of the fact that you want to keep this and you practice. I watched in my free time lots of Korean dramas. Um, I read a lot of Korean books. I read every morning I got up and I read the Korean newspaper online. Um, that's my morning coffee routine. The minute I get up, I make coffee and I sit in front of the computer and I read the Korean newspaper online uh, back in Boston. And I try to make as many Korean friends as possible. I try to expose myself to as much Korean as possible. Uh, listen to Korean music. Um, whatever I could. 
because otherwise you lose it. And sometimes you, I would talk to my mom, and I would forget how to sort of like say something. I'm like, oh, and you know that you've lost something. So you have to be constant, constantly trying. And I tried, and I think that's what helped keep me my way. Okay. Uh, just speaking a bit more about your experience here, uh, what's been your most frustrating experience being seen as a kid? I think um, the host said that earlier about her friend and the taxi driver. Um, I think for the first six months that I came to Korea, I got yelled at every day. Somebody yelled at me about something. I went to the market, the harmonies yelled at me because I have no idea what they're saying. I hear them, but the Jeonnam Satori is really strong. <laughs> and I'm trying to get used to Korean speaking all the time, but then there's Satori involved and you just go, what? And then they get really upset when you don't understand. Are you joking around with me? No. You know? And then they get really offended. But in things like that, it's like, a, I can't help that. Sometimes my brain doesn't process Korean as fast as I would like for it to, like it does English. So it takes a little time. And taxi drivers, they mumble something. I don't know what that means. He says, what? And then they get really upset. Why don't you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> Where are you from? America? Oh. <laughs> you know. But I think language barrier is one of the most difficult and frustrating things that I've had here. Sense, language is such a big part of As everything. <laughs> everything. Yeah. Um, you mentioned juggling different identities while growing up in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Could you give an example of when you felt like you weren't able to successfully juggle these identities? Yeah. Um, I like to think that's dating. Um, when I was in high school, all of my friends were dating. Everybody had a boyfriend. I'm like, me too, I don't want to. <laughs> and my parents thought, there's always time for that later. After you've graduated college with honors, after you've gone to grad school and then went to PhD and then, you know, whatever, plenty of time for that. You know? Until then you've been with us. <laughs> um, but you're so, your friends, you know, the more Americanized Korean friends or your foreign, like, American friends or, wherever, they have a social life. They go out, they you know, go to the movies together with their boyfriends and double dates and groups and prom and whatnot. But my parents didn't understand that. And they didn't want that. And it actually went, goes on until now. I'm 31 years old. And uh, in high school it was when you finish college, you can date. I finished college and they said, when you go to grad school, you can date. And then I came here and I said, I'm 31 years old. And they said, you will just get married and then you can date him then. <laughs> I said, I need to date so that I can get married. My parents said, it just naturally happens. We'll set you up with someone, you get married, and then you can date. We don't want to talk about this. We don't want to hear about it. <laughs> OK. Um, on that note, um, did you experience any discrimination in the States? And if so, how did you overcome uh, discrimination in the States? It's sad. sadly, I think. I think, like I said, more, I've experienced more of this whole, like, you know, foreign mess here than I did back home. Uh, in the United States, they do call me Korean or Korean American or Asian, but I don't think there was any direct anything. Here, I get it all the time. And like many of our Korean immigrants, uh, my friend said, we have never felt more foreign than we have in Korea. Because everyone reminds you how foreign you are. And back home, because I come from a melting pot country where there's so many different you know, ethnicities and cultures that it's not that big of a deal, I think. Although you do get labels. You, know, you have your Asian Korean labels. But here is where I felt the most amount of, like, I don't belong. I wouldn't call it discrimination, but I would say maybe just unacceptance. Okay. We have a few general questions yeah. that are sort of interesting. Um, so do you think foreign Koreans are in the same boat as 
called Bukja, so North Korean defenders, and I'm not sure if you can answer that. But um, I don't know what boat they were in, but I can kind of understand what the question means. And I'd like to say that um, I think just in the slightest degree that they do share a commonality. We're not Koreans, we're not seen fully as South Koreans don't see North Koreans and think, oh, that would be like, oh, from North Korea. They're different from us. They come from a different country than us. They've seen things that are different than us. Uh, they might not think the same way as us. It's kind of like the same thing in that sense where I think there's that gap of estrangement where the distance, there's a distance between South Koreans and Korean immigrants and then I mean, to not that extent, but I think the gap is still there. Um, and also, somebody wanted to know, what do you think about mixed race Koreans? Are they in the same boat, or do you think their experiences might be different? Much worse. Much worse. Um, which is kind of funny. When I first landed in Korea, I was dispatched to Kangjin. Uh, Kangjin was my first place in Korea where I became a teacher, and I taught at an elementary school in the woods. And it's so remotely in the woods. And the teachers, when I first arrived, thought I was mixed. I don't know why. They said, I don't look fully Korean. They said, your eyes are too big. I said, what? <laughs> but because immediately somebody said I was mixed, and then somebody else said, oh, well, maybe she is mixed. I'm standing right here, but they would talk through me. <laughs> oh, she does look mixed while looking at me. And I said, no, no, my parents are Korean. I'm speaking a fluent Korean, please. I'm not, not that it's that big of a deal, but I'm not. And then they said, I think she's mixed. <laughs> so after that, there was some kind of like, like even a further of a gap where they, they actually, I think this is a very, you know, isolated case, so I don't think all Koreans think like that, but the few that I've met at that school have called me a dirty blood, where they said, she's a dirty blood, don't talk to her. And I said, what is a dirty blood? And it's when Korean blood gets mixed in with another race, and the blood gets dirty. And they thought, because they thought I was mixed, that I was a dirty blood. And so, when I first arrived in Korea to this school, for almost like three weeks, no one talked to me. The teachers didn't talk to me. The, the principal, vice principal, <coughs> stayed away from me. And they said, I don't know what background she comes from, but we want nothing to do with it. And uh, so I think things like that, I see that so many times, like, you know, like, like Filipino teachers, like that I see like in the countryside, there's a there's a almost like a caste system. Like it, there's a gap. They're they're not at our level. They're different. They're low. If anything, they're down there with the Yokos, you know, but just maybe a little bit lower. <laughs> so I I see that. I think that's very heartbreaking. Um, after you came back to Korea, did you ever try to change any of your Western habits? And if so, could you share any of those? Ooh, so many. Um, yeah, uh, first habit was I realized I couldn't go to e in sneakers because everybody's wearing heels. Um, I've had, I think, there is such a cultural difference. I see everything that I normally do back in the States, a lot of that is it's not that it's not acceptable, unacceptable, it's just, it's strange here. Um, you know, sometimes I wear PJs outside and go to the local march, but apparently you don't do that here. Um, I used to eat lots of pizza and burgers, and you know, you put on a few pounds, but it's okay, because in America, I'm thin. And then I come here and I realize, like, every doctor's like, overweight. And I said, oh, really? <laughs> So I've changed a lot of my eating habits, which is great. Um, I did lose a few kilos being Korean, but it's not because like I'm trying to fit in. It's just when someone calls you overweight, you should probably go on a diet. <laughs> um, 
So here's our final question of the day. If you didn't get a chance to ask Trian direct, uh, please come up and ask her directly, just in the interest of time. But so our final question is, what's your favorite aspect about being a Kyoko in Korea? I have many. Um, I love that I'm a Kyoko. I love that I'm Korean American. I have. I like to think the best of both worlds. Um, I have, yeah, I, I'm bilingual, but those things are not what make me love being Korean American. I love Korean culture. I love all the holidays, all like the mannerisms between the you know older and younger generation. I love that. I embrace that. But at the same time, I'm very free. And Koreans are right. I'm very liberal. I'm very opinionated. I have a lot to say. I'm really. I'm really loud for a female in Korea, and I'm okay with it, you know. Um, I got to receive the best education that I could have asked for. I got the best Korean parents I could have asked for. I got the best American friends that anyone can ask for. I have had a chance to live in many different cities in the U.S., and now I get to live in Cheonam in a few weeks. I get to go to Seoul because I have a job offer. I get to experience so many things that not many people get to see and experience. Um, one of my professors in college, I went to Harvard University, and one of my professors said, you, meaning us in the classroom, are among the 1% in the world that have the kind of life that everyone wishes for, and said, with that comes a lot of responsibility, and with that means you have to give back as much as you can because you've been given so much. And I agree, I've been given a lot. And I had no intentions of living here. I just wanted to visit for one year and go back to America. I never want to leave. I love this country, and I'm so thankful that I get both. And I'm so thankful that I got to experience both for long periods of time because I could communicate, I could understand, I could be at both. And at first in America, I thought that was a fault. I thought I always have to juggle. It's very overwhelming. It's a burden. But now, it's like the best gift that I could have had. And I mean, people are right. I do have excellent parents. So I want to personally thank Trion because uh, several of us here are proud to call her our leader and our coordinator. And I think from today's presentation, it really spoke to all of us, whether we're foreigners or whether we're Koreans or whether we're uh, foreign Koreans. And because I think what you spoke about, I think we can all relate to in some aspect. And I think all of us really learned a lot and it's been a really enlightening presentation. So let's give Trion one more round of applause.